second part, I, I was uh, I added it due to popular request. It was not initially a part of, the, part of the talk, but you'll see. So the first part is a research talk, and the second part deals with K-12 math education in California. Is this mic working, by the way? I think so. Now it's on? Yeah. It's working? Okay, good. So yeah, the research part of the talk is this private frequency estimation via projective geometry. This is joint work with uh, Vitaly Feldman and Kunal Talwar at Apple and Hui Wen at Northeastern. I was having a little too much fun with the, the, the slide, the title slide there, using projective geometry, of course. Um, and then at the end, a little bit on K-12 math education, mostly talking about California. So <clears throat> first part of the talk, so what is it about? So most of us, I think, have smartphones and we rely on various features in our smartphones that make using them more uh, enjoyable. They, features like autocomplete or automatic spell correction. Okay. And how do these features work? Well, um, you know, here's a patent that I found online by Apple. Okay. Um, bottom line is they need to you know, learn, our, learn from our data, right? So let me actually just zoom in on the part that's boxed in the bottom right. Systems and methods are disclosed for a server learning new words, the server is them, generated by user client devices, that's our iPhones, in a crowdsourced manner. Okay, so, okay, so you might read this and say, but does this mean they're reading our texts and learning from our texts to then train their ML models to get better autocomplete and spell correction? Right? Okay. That is roughly what it means. Okay. Uh, but you know, we'll come back to that. <clears throat> I think, I don't speak for them. Okay, I'm being recorded. Okay, so um, here's the setup. There's a server, which is say the person making the, the texting app or the device manufacturer. And then there's a bunch of devices. And let's just say, you know, let's make it simple, our lives simple. Uh, I'm just paying attention to the last word you texted your friend on your phone. Okay, so each device has the last word that it was it texted. And the server wants to know like, word popularities of different words in the dictionary. So it wants to know a histogram F, where F sub X is how many devices are holding the word X. They just texted the word X. Okay. These are the kinds of things that the server would want to know. I mean, they want to know other things too, but for example. Simple enough. Every time you text your friend, you send a carbon copy of your text to the device manufacturer. They learn texting patterns of everyone in the world who's using their devices, and then they can learn how to do spell correct or whatever. But there's a constraint, which is privacy. Do you really want the phone manufacturer to read all of your texts? Probably not. And if you go back to that patent uh, filing, you'll notice all these uh, things that I've boxed in red. While main so you want to learn in a crowdsourced manner, but while maintaining local differential privacy, a differential privacy system, privacy budget, privacy, privacy, privacy. So they're aware that their customers, us, are not maybe happy with uh, the company learning everything about us. Okay. So how do you, how does the server, how does the device, device manufacturer learn from us in a way that maintains our privacy? And the basic idea is, yes, we're going to text our friends, but we're not going to send a carbon copy of that text to the device manufacturer. We're going to send some other message to the device manufacturer, which is some randomized thing that adds noise, whatever that means, we're going to see in a second, to hide, you know, to hide a lot about our information. Uh, to the device manufacturer. So let's pretend, for example, that we're not texting words to our friends, but we're texting images. Like I just attended, this is a couple years old, a few years old, I attended the baby shower of my first daughter, and there was a game where it's like, who could drink from a baby bottle the fastest? That's the actual text message I sent my friend. But then what I sent to the server is some noisified version of that, and here I'm progressively adding more and more noise, like static, basically. This is not what we're actually, I'm just giving you an idea, okay? You'll see what we actually do. And here it is with a ton of noise. <clears throat> and the basic idea is something like the following, although this, the picture on the right is not as clear as I'd like it. But, okay, so here's the basic idea. This picture of me drinking from a baby bottle, if there's only one phone in the world that's texting this picture, like I'm texting it to my wife, then, okay, the server might not learn it. That's okay. But if it went viral, and people all over the world are texting this photo, then the server would really like to know that. So you can think that you know, once something is popular enough, the server should learn it, which means there are lots of devices out there sending this particular 
word, which is this image, okay? And each one of them is independently noisifying it with independent random noise. And there are some other people in the world who are texting other things, like a cat or whatever, right? Not everyone is texting, not everyone in the world is texting this picture. And I would like a procedure where everyone is individually noisifying things and the server could somehow aggregate all these noisified images and extract knowledge from it and realize, oh, this, this picture, and maybe they won't completely recover the picture exactly precisely, but they'll recover something close to the original picture. And they'll be like, well, I can, I can ascertain that this particular picture is something that's going viral, but I don't know who actually sent it. I know that many people amongst these people on the left sent it, but I don't know who, I don't know. So that's the privacy that's being maintained, okay? So the moral, what we want the moral of the story to be is that we can have each individual, individual message look like total random garbage, uh, and that th therefore protecting individual privacy, but in a way that the server can still extract useful knowledge by aggregation. Okay, so that's the goal of what I'm going to talk about. But what exactly does privacy mean? And you have to be careful. Here's, here's an example. This is a real example. I took that same image and I added a ton of noise on the left. You can barely tell, I don't think you can't tell at all what's going on, right? I think, okay. And then I ran some signal processing algorithm on that called wavelet denoising. It doesn't really matter what it is. But lo and behold, from the garbage came, I mean, okay, it's not as good quality as the original image, but you can tell that it's a person drinking from something and they're wearing a jacket. You know, you're not supposed to be able to tell anything about any individual's data. But from this one individual message that's randomized, you're able to actually extract a lot of information. So this is bad, okay? I don't want this kind of thing to happen. So we need to be careful with our definitions. We need to mathematically define like what does privacy mean and then prove that whatever algorithm we're doing is actually satisfying that definition, okay? So <clears throat> we're gonna use a definition that's kind of a gold standard in this area called local differential privacy, okay? Um, what is the idea? So the idea is similar to what you saw before where each device I will send a random message M sub I that is only weakly correlated with its data Xi. Xi is like a word in the dictionary or it's a picture of me drinking from a bottle. And we want that one individual device's message almost looks like random garbage, just like I said, but the server can extract from the aggregate. But then here's the, here's the privacy definition. Okay. By the way, I know, I know where I'm standing, I'm like blocking this uh, projector, but you can see, am I, is, is it inconvenient for anyone on, the, on this side of the room? Is it okay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> So what's the let's just walk through what this math means. What does it mean to satisfy epsilon differential privacy? Okay, so for any device I, any phone, and any possible message M that the device could send, let's look at different data elements. X is a picture of me drinking from a bottle, and X prime is a picture of a cat. The probability that device I sends that message M, given that its data is the bottle picture, versus the probability that it sends that same message M given that its data is a picture of a cat, these two probabilities should be close. That's the privacy definition, okay? In other words, the, the, the probability distribution over messages you send should not be too sensitive to your data. And close means that the ratio should be at most e to the epsilon, okay? When epsilon is zero, e to the epsilon is one, which means e to the zero is one, right? Which means that my probability distribution of messages I send is the same no matter what my data is, which intuitively means you're not learning anything about my data from my message. So that's perfect privacy. So epsilon, we'll call epsilon the privacy loss parameter, and epsilon being zero means there's no privacy loss. You're not losing any privacy. And as you increase epsilon, the right-hand side becomes bigger than one, so you start having gaps in these probabilities, and then you have more privacy, you have positive privacy loss, you have some amount of actual privacy loss. Okay. So there are two regimes to keep in mind with this definition. The first is small epsilon, where I mean epsilon is like 0.01, it's less than one. So there's very little privacy loss, and there e to the epsilon is roughly one plus epsilon, just by Taylor, Taylor approximation. And the other regime is large epsilon, not that large. I think in reality people usually use like five or six or something. Um, so e to the five is around 150. And that's what's usually deployed in practice. And um, you might say, well, wait, I thought these companies wanted to, satisfy, you know, wanted to maintain my privacy, 
why am I allowing them to use large epsilon? Like that, you know, if you set epsilon to be infinity, that means that uh, there's no privacy whatsoever. Why am I happy with large epsilon? Well, okay, before I answer that question, we should first understand that there is a fundamental trade-off between utility and privacy. Utility meaning the quality of knowledge that the server is able to extract from the messages. Okay, so on the one hand, if epsilon is zero, there's no privacy loss, but then the utility is arbitrarily bad, right? They don't learn anything about the data. So really great privacy, awesome privacy, no utility. The other extreme is epsilon is infinity, which is there's no privacy at all. They're not maintaining privacy. They're sending the messages in the clear, but the server learns the data exactly, okay? So then you could ask like, I mean, you would suspect that there is some kind of, would hope that there's some kind of smooth trade-off as you move epsilon between zero and infinity that uh, the utility somehow smoothly changes, okay? And it turns out for the problem we're considering today, that is true, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. But because of that, you know, remember now, I mean, the, device, the server probably really wants to learn our data, okay? They really want to provide, uh, yeah. So you mentioned that this utility is kind of inverse of this privacy. However, the equation that you show us in the last slide, there, this utility was not mentioned anywhere. So how can we understand that they are actually inverse to each other? Oh, yeah, so when I, when I defined privacy, I did not mention utility, is that what you're saying? Yes, that's true. Um, so I guess, yeah, I'm only, introducing util I'm only introducing utility now, but just like intuitively, the, the, the more that I try to mask privacy, if I tell you that privacy needs to be perfect, you, don't, you shouldn't learn anything, then there should be no utility, right? How can there be any utility if they're not learning anything? Intuitively, I understand. Yeah, yeah, so we'll, yeah, but we'll get there. the theoretical background behind it? Yeah, I mean, about the theoretical background, I haven't even defined utility yet, actually, like mathematically, so we'll get there. But just, we're, we're just at intuition now, right? That like, they should be inversely related, right? Okay, and you know, the company wants to get as much utility as they can from our data. So they would love it if epsilon were infinity, but you know, they're constrained. They've promised us that they're gonna maintain some level of privacy. So they'd like, to, they'd like to set epsilon to be as large as possible without pissing us off, or you know, without violating the law or whatever it is, okay? Um, but then there's like some silver lining which basically says, if you have a local differentially private algorithm, remember the model, the model is that you have n devices on the left, you have the server on the right, each one is sending a randomized message to the server. So if you create a mechanism in this model that satisfies a particular epsilon, and then you just run that algorithm in a different model called the shuffle model, which I'm not gonna define right now, there are theorems that say that the effective epsilon you get by running that mechanism in this alternate model is automatically amplified. If your old, if your, if your, if your epsilon was epsilon, your new epsilon is roughly, let's say if your old epsilon was some constant, two, your new epsilon is some constant divided by root n, roughly, where n is the number of devices. The no, n is the number of people who are using an iPhone, for example, okay? So the point is if you have a lot of users out there and then you run your local differentially private mechanism in this shuffle model, um, you automatically get a much better uh, privacy guarantee. So that's why they're able to kind of morally get away with deploying with epsilon being five, because then um, their, their effective epsilon in the, in the field is actually some function of five divided by square root of the number of iPhones out there. Yeah. Doesn't this assume that there's nobody's like picking up on traffic going back and forth? between you and the server? Uh, what do you mean by picking up on traffic? So like if, if you were communicating with the server yes. and then the server, when it receives it, shuffles it, if somebody's picking up on the traffic before the server shuffles it, then it's... Okay, so I guess I, I didn't define the shuffle model. Let me first define, I'll just say what the shuffle model is because it's not super complicated. So the model you saw was devices here, there's a server there, and then the shuffle model, there's like one extra server called the shuffler who sits in the middle and they're the ones who actually receive the messages. And their only job is to take the messages and apply uniformly random permutation and then forward those off to the server. Okay, so I guess your question is about what happens when, um, let's say, before the message reaches the shuffler, someone intercepts it and, and sees it. 
I mean, that, that can happen. Um, if that happens, then, and, and then they leak, they leak that information to the, the actual server or something, then you don't get the privacy amplification. But you still do get whatever epsilon, I mean, the message that came out of the device in the first place is not the raw data. It's a randomized message. So you'll still get whatever epsilon guarantee you had from the local model. But you wouldn't get the amplification. OK. So let's keep going. So OK, so now that we're all uh, on the same page with the model, what is the problem being studied today? So I kind of already said it, but let me just say it firmly. Each device holds some, each device i holds a data element xi, which is an element of the universe, 1 to k. Let's say k is the size of some dictionary. Um, this implies a frequency histogram f. The xth coordinate of f is just the number of devices whose data is x. And the server wants to recover an f tilde that is close to f. And closeness I'm going to measure as mean squared error, which is the average distance between the true frequency of an element and the, and, uh, and the, 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 the estimate that I produced of the, of the frequency squared. Okay. Um, this is going to be a random variable. <coughs> because, the, because the algorithms are all randomized, f tilde is going to be like a random vector that I reconstruct. So I want that to be small, say, an expectation or with high probability or something. In this talk, I'm going to talk about expectation. And as I'm designing the algorithm, what are the things that I want to optimize? There are five things in this talk that I'll care about and think I want all five of these to be small. So the privacy loss is epsilon. Everything else considered, if I fix all the other four things, the smaller epsilon is the better, more privacy. Utility is the mean squared error. Again, if you fix all the four other things, the smaller utility loss, the better. I want small reconstruction error. Low communication, each device has to send a randomized message. That's some B bit message. I want B to be low. Server time. The server collects all these messages, applies some algorithm to them to then, to then figure, compute some F tilde. I want that algorithm to be fast. And then the device time, which is I'm a phone, I have my data. I need to figure out what, message to, what randomized message I'm going to send given my data. That should be fast too. Okay, so I want all five to be small. And of course, the first two are related. There, we, you expect there's going to be some privacy utility trade off. So before I tell you what we did, <clears throat> let me just get you, uh, just out of curiosity, who's like seen local differential privacy at all before this talk? OK, minority of people, which is fine. So let me uh, give you a quick crash course on some of the you know, basic mechanisms that exist in this space before our work. So one is something called randomized response. OK? Remember now the definition of privacy. For any message that I could send, you know, that if, I, if my data is x versus x prime, the ratio and probabilities of sending that message, that ratio should be bounded by e to the epsilon. Okay? So what do I do? Each device will send its true item x with probability e to the epsilon p. Otherwise, it sends a uniformly random other element so that any other element is sent with probability p. Okay? Now what is p? There's only one value of p I can put into this which makes it make any sense. So the problem that I send something is one. What's the problem that I send something? Well, I either send my true data, which is probably e to the epsilon p, or I send some other element in the universe. There are k minus one other elements. Each one has probability p. That has to equal one. So solve for p, and I get something. So that specifies what the device does. What does the server do? It's going to use some linear estimator. What do I mean by that? OK, it wants to, let's say the server wants to estimate how many devices are holding data elements x. What do I do? For each message mi that I receive as the server, I'm going to think like, do I think that the user who sent this message has x or not? If the message is x, I'm going to think it's more likely that they were really holding x. So if the message was x, I will add alpha plus beta to a counter. If it's not x, I'll only add beta. What are alpha and beta? Well, <clears throat> okay. first of all, I'll get to that in a second. If xi equals x, the expected contribution to this counter is, well, I remember, I always add the beta, no matter what. What's the problem that I add the alpha? The problem that I add the alpha is e to the epsilon p. So that's the expected contribution when xi equals x. If xi is not equal to x, then the problem that I send the alpha is only p. So I get alpha p plus beta, right? OK, so you tell me, I mean, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page here. If I want this to be an unbiased estimator of fx, what do I want this to equal? Right? 
right? If you're actually holding x, what do I want the expected contribution to the counter to be? One. One. And if you're not holding x, I want it to be 0. So I want the first thing to be 1. I want the second thing to be 0. I have two equations and two unknowns, alpha and beta. I can solve for alpha and beta, and I get something. So that's it. That's the whole protocol. I've told you what the device does. I've told you how, what the server does. That's it. OK? And if you, if you, now, that you know what the, now that you know what the mechanism is, you can analyze, compute its variance. What is, the, what is the expected mean squared error? It's a calculation. You could do it. Okay. And if you do that calculation, you'll get some really bad utility loss. Yeah? Could you explain why x, when x has not equal value, you have bar for p plus beta? Why not beta itself? Oh, because even if, even if, even if the data is not x, there's still a chance that the message I send is x, right? And the chance that, the chance that I send x if I'm not holding x is p. Yeah, you're with me? It's OK. OK. OK, so if you, if you do the analysis, it turns out the utility loss is terrible. But the nice things are the communication's not that big. You'll see, you'll, I'll compare it to the next thing. That has really bad communication. Um, in particular, like, you're trying to send an element of the universe that should take log k bits. Instead, you're sending possibly some other element of the universe. It's still only log k bits. So there's no like, communication overhead compared to sending your actual data, which I'm happy with. And it's a linear time algorithm for the server. <coughs> right? So the server just loops through all the messages. And then for each message, mi, it just you know, adds something. It, add, you know, it adds an alpha to the, ith, to the mith counter. Okay, and then it adds beta n to all counters at the end or something. So it's a very fast algorithm. Okay. Um, now here's another simple scheme. This is doing Yi and Barg. Okay, and it's a little bit. It's uh, there's some similarities, but it's not exactly the same. Um, so what is the, What is this algorithm? <clears throat> so there's a parameter d. We'll get we'll get to that parameter later. But there's a parameter d, which is some integer, positive integer. Each device will send a random subset of the universe of size d. Of all k choose d set, sets of size d, it chooses a random one. If So now, what are the probabilities? If the set s contains x, x is its data. If it contains x, we'll send that set with probability e to the epsilon p. If it doesn't contain x, we'll only send that set with probability p. What's p? Again, there's only one value of p where this makes any sense, because something has to be 1. The problem that I send something is 1. What's the probability that I send a set that contains x? Well, how many sets contain x? k minus 1 choose d minus 1. OK, so those each have probably e to the epsilon p. How many sets don't contain x? k minus 1 choose d. right? And those have probability p. So that sum has to be 1, so p is something. What does the server do to estimate? So now we know what the device does. What does the server do to estimate the frequency of x? It's going to be very similar. If x is in mi, now mi is a set. If x is in mi, I'll add alpha plus beta. Otherwise, I only add beta. If xi equals x, the expected contribution is something. If it's not equal to x, the expected contribution is something else. You can you know, figure what these things are not too hard to come up with if you sit down and think about it for a few seconds, a few minutes. We want the first thing to equal 1. We want the second thing to equal 0, just like last time. So two equations and two unknowns. OK, once you, <clears throat> once you um, solve for alpha and beta, of course, alpha and beta will be functions of d, just like p is a function of d. Now you do some variance calculation to compute the expected mean squared error, and you'll get an expression that's a function of d. d was a parameter. You then do some calculus, set a derivative to 0 or something, optimize, and choose the, the best d you can to minimize the mean squared error. It turns out that the right value of d to choose is something like k over e to the epsilon. If epsilon is a constant, the denominator is just some constant. So d is proportional to k. k is the size of the whole dictionary. So I have one word in the dictionary, and my message is almost as big as sending the entire dictionary, like sending like 10% of the dictionary. Okay? So the con is that the communication is terrible. I'm sending really big messages. And also, just because the messages are so big, like even for the server to read all the messages takes forever. So the server is going to be really slow as well. Instead of linear time, it's going to be like quadratic time. The pro is that 
you can prove the lower bound. Actually, Yi and Barg, in a different paper, actually, they got the lower bound before the upper bound. This is actually optimal privacy loss, utility loss trade-off. So for any fixed epsilon, the utility loss they achieve is the best possible question. Um, can you explain what utility loss is again? It's the expectation of f minus f tilde L2 norm squared divided by k or something. But yeah, it's the, you, you, the squared Euclidean uh, distance. And when I say optimal, I mean, they really, they really nailed the optimal. It's not asymptotically optimal. It's like four times whatever, whatever, whatever. Like the, that expression is optimal up to little o of one factors. One plus little o of one factors. OK, great. OK, so we had a really fast algorithm on the last slide, but terrible utility loss. Now we have great utility loss, but terrible runtime and terrible communication. Great. So now we want the best of all worlds, right? Why not? So for, let's just realize now that both of these um, fit under a certain meta approach. OK? What is the meta approach? Again, data is in this element, uh, universal size k. And there's some message space y. And whatever, whenever a device sends a message, the message it sends will be an element of message space. So in randomized response, message space was just the universe itself. In subset selection, message space was the set of all size d subsets of 1 to k. But you, know, you can construct whatever message space you want. And for each element of the universe x, we'll have a subset of message space, which is the preferred messages for x. I prefer to send a message that's a preferred message. So for example, in um, randomized response, SX is a singleton set that only contains X. In subset selection, SX is the set of all size D subsets that contain X. And <clears throat> I'll construct a set system where these preferred message lists all have the same size for every data element in the universe. They all have size little s. And also it'll be like some design. What I mean by that, if I have x and x prime, which are two different elements of the universe, their preferred message lists always intersect. Uh, at the, they always have the same intersection size, which I'll call L. In randomized response, L was 0, right? because you have two singleton sets that don't intersect. Okay, great. So the mechanism is, you know, I have my data x. I'm trying to figure out what probability should I assign to y. Well, if y is not a preferred message, I send it with probability p. And if it is a preferred message, I send it probably e to the epsilon p. Again, p is uh, determined. Okay. The pro how many preferred messages do I have? S. Each one has e to the epsilon p probability. How many non-preferred messages do I have? Y minus s. Each one has probability p. The server will estimate fx as a similar thing you saw before. If, <clears throat> if mi is a preferred message, I'll add alpha plus beta. If it's not a preferred message, I only add beta. Again, we want if x equals x, I sum it as expectation 1. Otherwise, it has expectation 0. I get two equations, two unknowns. I can solve for alpha and beta. They depend on s and l as well as p. And p depends on also the size of the message space uh, as well as epsilon and s. Okay. And then now that the protocol is determined, I can then compute its mean squared error. And this slide only exists as a proof of concept to say, look, there is a calculation you can do. You can do it. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Uh, let me, uh, line by line, you'd have to follow this. All that matters is I can get a closed form expression for the expected mean squared error what, just as a, as, a, as a function of properties of this uh, kind of combinatorial set system. As a function of s, which is the size of the preferred message lists, l, which is the intersection sizes. It also depends on epsilon and n. And it also depends on the size of message space. Okay. And in particular, I want the ratio L over S to be small. That makes this small. And I want the ratio Y over S to also be small. And if you look at this and you think about, okay, why? Oh, and, and I highlighted in blue kind of the leading term. The, that fraction in white, just take my word for it, is a, a smaller order term than the teal one. Okay. If you, if you then look at this and say, why is it that subset selection did so well, you'll realize that kind of what happened there when you chose D at the end, what happened was you basically ended up getting an L over S that canceled this E to the epsilon, minus 1. And then Y over S equals this E to the epsilon minus 1. 
So since this canceled, you get 1 plus 1 is 2. And then you get this equals that, so you get another 2 times e to the epsilon minus 1. So this 2 times whatever times another 2 is a 4. So you get like 4n e to the epsilon something. So that's where 4 came from. It came from those two terms canceling or whatever. Okay. Great. So in any case, now mechanism design under this meta approach reduces to a combinatorial question. Right? How do you design a set system that has the nice LNS you want, the nice message space you want? Also, keep in mind that what's the message length? The message length is log of y bits. Y is message space. Specifying an element of y takes log of size of y bits. So you also want y to be small, all of the things considered. Okay. So you, you have these kind of combinatorial expressions that you're trying to all make small at the same time. You also want that somehow your set system has to be such that you can compute all of these values for all x simultaneously quickly because you want a fast algorithm, right? Um, I mean, you could, you could like just double for loop, loop over x, and then loop over all i, and then compute this for each one separately. But you want something better than that if possible. That's, yeah, okay, yes, question. Uh, why isn't n k? Because I thought the histogram would be the size of the universe. <coughs> like, I, I guess what is n? n is the number of devices. Devices. k is the size of the universe, n is the number of devices. I see, I see. That's right. Yeah. And okay. the mean squared error does depend on n. And I guess it would depend on k, except in my definition, I divided by k. Okay. Yeah. Um, OK, so now, yeah, so I mean, roughly, OK, well, let me, I'll get there. Let me, I'll come back to that, but yeah. So now this is a combinatorial, question, uh, combinatorial design question. And here's one, here's one uh, approach to try and do something. And um, it's not going to quite work, but we'll fix it. So we'll pick some prime q. Later, we'll set q to be the right thing. Don't worry about what q is right now. I said e to the epsilon. Just q is some prime. <clears throat> And message space is going to be fq to the t. So all t-dimensional vectors over the finite field fq, finite field of q elements. And I'll pick t large enough so that the size of fq to the t is bigger than or equal to k, which means I can view any element in my universe as an element of fq to the t, okay? which basically means that t has to be the ceiling of log base q of k. OK, so now, remember now, I, now I can pretend I can pretend that every element in my universe is a t-dimensional vector over fq. So I'll define its preferred message list as a subspace of fq to the t, which is the t minus 1 dimensional subspace orthogonal to x. Any y such that x dot y is 0 mod q. Okay. I'm going to define that to be my preferred message list. And then Sx, if I look at two different preferred message lists, these are just two different subspaces, each of dimension t minus 1, I intersect them, I get a t minus 2 dimensional subspace. So this means that little s, my preferred message list has size q to the t minus 1, and my, uh, my intersection sizes have q to the t minus 2. So then I get L over s and s over y to both be 1 over q. And then I set q to be e to the epsilon, roughly, or e to the epsilon minus 1. Whatever I needed, remember I said that the magic happens when L over s cancels that, right? So basically, I'll just, L over s is now 1 over q. So I'll pick q to be as close to this as possible. Um, great. Not so fast. Doesn't quite work. And the reason it doesn't work is, you know, these are, x, the xi's are just different elements of fq to the t. Like, what if one element of fq to the t is 1, 0, 0, and the other element of fq to the t is 2, 0, 0? Then actually, their preferred message lists are the same. They define the same orthogonal subspace. So the intersection of sx and sy is not a t minus 2 dimensional subspace. It's just the, t, it's the same t minus 1 dimensional subspace back again. Right? So that's a problem. It doesn't satisfy our meta approach that I said. But that's OK. The fix is projective geometry. Um, and honestly, OK, so I, I will go through this slide just because I think it's interesting. I, I didn't know about this before working on this project. I mean, the, the, real, the real fix is, OK, so there's this thing called projective space. It's not too complicated. All it means, all it means is you normalize vectors, OK? So your space will not be fq to the t. 
it'll be normalized FQt, projective FQt. What does that mean? It means that any, you, know, you take the set of all non-zero vectors, and then for any non-zero vector, you normalize it so that its first non-zero entry is a one. So you just look at what is its first non-zero entry going from left to right, divide everything in the finite field by that number, and then now you have a normalized vector. And if you have a normalized vector like that, then you can't, it's not going to be the case that two different elements of the space are multiples of each other, which means that they will always define different orthogonal subspaces. Okay? And the connection, so it's funny, I, I don't know why this happened. I was invited to give a talk to like a media and arts department, and I warned them, I was like, you know, I'm, that's not what I do. <laughs> I don't really know anything about art. Um, but then I tried to fit in this talk into art, and I was like, well, where did projective geometry come from? Or like, why is it important? And actually, the reason it's important, I mean, one of the reasons it's important, there, there are others, I guess, is you know, it's connected to like Renaissance art, right? So you know, one of the big innovations in the Renaissance was drawing more realistic you know, pictures, right? Oh, yeah. Ending your perspective. Yeah, exactly. So it's like drawing in perspective. Yes, exactly. Uh, do, do people know about this, drawing in perspective? Some people, not everyone. OK. So I mean, the idea is like, this is you, right? This yellow person. And you're standing on a road. And these are like the edges of the road, which are parallel lines, of course. right? And you're just looking out into the distance. Um, and you're drawing onto a canvas. right? So this, this uh, plane here is like the picture plane, they call it. So that's the canvas you're drawing on. And you know, what, this, what these lines indicate is each, this is like your eye. And if you just look anywhere out into the world, there's like a, a, a line that, or a ray that comes out of your eye onto the world, right? And that ray intersects the picture plane, the canvas. And anything on that line projects uh, onto the same point on the canvas. So in other words, lines become points, right? Which is exactly what we were doing when we said, look, uh, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0. These are, these are all on a particular line out of the origin. And we're gonna, we're gonna normalize to map all these points on the line to a single point. That's, that's the projection. That's the projective geometry, okay? So like, everything on this line is the, sa is the same point on the canvas. Everything on that line is a different point. And there are some cool things that happen when you draw in perspective, like uh, parallel lines, like the edges of this road, actually are not parallel in the drawing. Uh, they actually intersect at infinity. And this infinity, usually in art, I guess in perspective drawing, they call it the vanishing point. But whatever, OK, this is not an art class. Yes? So like, when you move to projective space, don't you get like collisions between your messages at, like, when you represent them in projective space? Like 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, those could be two distinct messages in your initial vector space? Ah, OK, good. So, okay, so first of all, now the space that I work in is projective space. So every element of my universe I will view as an element of projective space. Oh, so you do have the assignment. So, so like 1, 0, 0, and 2, 0, 0 don't exist anymore. There's only 1, 0, 0 now. And then I'm going to say, well, let me just go to the next slide. Oh, there's a picture of it. <laughs> but anyway, you can see like that's the origin there. And then I guess these two, everything that is the same color are like the, are the same points in projective space because they're on, they're on a line, but a, a line in FQ, F3 to the 3. Yes, OK, anyway, that's, uh, this is for the art people. Um, so, so you define projective points in FQ of the T as non-zero vectors whose first non-zero is a one. You normalize them, and then you can show. I mean, can show is, is uh, I mean, it's not that complicated. So the point is, how many projective points are there? So there are Q to the T vectors in FQT. Take out the origin, so you subtract one, and then every non-zero vector has Q minus one different scaling, so normalized by Q minus one. That's the number of projective points that exist. And I'll choose t to be such that the number of projective points is at least k. So now I can identify elements of the universe with projective points. And my preferred set now is the projective subspace orthogonal to x. That is, all u projective vectors u. u is a vector in projective geometry that uh, satisfies x dot u is 0 mod q. Um, and then you can, you know, now that you have the construction, you can figure out what s and l are. And it turns out that everyone's happy at the end, OK? So this is it. OK, so I mean, I still have time left. What I want to show you is, first of all, 
you know, we implemented this thing and we implemented all the previous algorithms and it works well. And also the thing that's maybe not obvious right now is like, why does this lend itself to a fast algorithm? Where does, the, where does the speed come into play? So let's talk about that. First of all, here's a communication utility loss server time. We give two new algorithms. One is the algorithm I just told you, which is this, what we call projective geometry response. And the other is a, a hybrid projective geometry response algorithm. And what, what, are, what is the difference? So you'll notice like the previous state of the art, there was something that got pretty decent communication and optimal utility loss. This is the optimal bound, even the constant factor is optimal. But the server time was like quadratic. That was the previous state of the art. If you look at projective geometry response, it gets great communication, optimal utility loss, and like almost linear runtime. N plus k log k times e to the epsilon. Okay, now this e to the epsilon, remember I said in practice epsilon is often five when people deploy these things. So e to the epsilon is 150. So okay, it's linear time, but there's a, there's a 150 factor right there. Can I reduce that? And if you look at some of the previous algorithms, they were actually closer to linear time. They had like runtimes of n plus k log k without any e to the epsilon in them at all. But those did not have optimal utility loss, right? So what we do in our hybrid algorithm is we show that you can kind of smoothly trade off. If you, if you really don't like that factor 150 slowdown in your runtime, you can trade off speed for utility loss. So we show that if you're willing, if you're willing to worsen your utility loss by a 1 plus 1 over q minus 1 factor, for any q, q can be any prime of your choice, then you can turn that e to the epsilon in the runtime into a q. So like imagine q is 5. So I could get n plus 5k log k as my runtime, but I, I'll have to sacrifice and worsen my utility loss by 25%. So instead of 4n, I'll be 5n, which is still better than 8n, I guess. Okay. So that's, that's the statement of what, you know, our, our contribution. And then I want to maybe show some plots and then talk about why the algorithm is fast. And then at the end we can talk about, maybe I'll take a break for questions before we move into part two, which is math education stuff, which is completely unrelated. Well, I, I don't know, it's not unrelated. I mean, I guess you have to get educated in math to be able to do algorithms. <laughs> um, yeah, so questions before we move on. Yeah. The uh, projective geometry is slightly different from like math definition in algebraic geometry, right? Because there you also could have the first coordinate zero and then recursively the previous, the, you know, one dimension less in the, in the other coordinates. And <coughs> Wait, I said I could have the first coordinate zero? I could also have the first coordinate zero. Oh. I'm just saying, so for me, I'm just saying the first non-zero, the first non-zero coordinate oh, has to be a one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, so here's some plots. Um, roughly, what do the plots mean? So remember, it's a randomized mechanism, right? So the error I get is a random variable. So I just ran the experiment a lot of times, I don't know, 100 times, 1,000 times, something. And I looked at, each time I ran it, what was the error? What was the mean squared error? So I get like a, a CDF, empirical CDF of the error distribution. And then different color, so the y-axis is the error, high is, is bad, that's more error. And then this is, this is the percentiles in the CDF, in the empirical CDF. Um, blue is randomized response, remember that's the super duper fast algorithm, but really bad error, as you can see empirically. And then from now on, I'm just gonna stop plotting randomized response because it's so bad that you can't really even distinguish the other ones on the plot. So there's the, almost, there's a different plot without the blue one, without the randomized response. Um, Green and red up top, those have a constant factor worse mean squared error. So you can see instead of like, I don't know, 150, they have 600 or something. But they're really fast, okay? And then down here, blue is subset selection, which is an optimal algorithm. It has optimal expected mean squared error. That's the one that we, you saw that has really bad communication. And then the teal is our new algorithm, which is you know, basically right there down with uh, subset selection in terms of error, which is great. And then the yellow one is our hybrid algorithm. Remember I said if you're willing to worsen, if you're willing to worsen the utility loss by 25%, you can get a fast algorithm. So that's the yellow one. More plots, it's just basically, I, I may not spend too much, too much time on this, but 
it's, you know, we ran different kinds of experiments with different kinds of data. It, the picture all, always looked very similar. Kind of teal, and teal is us. Blue is subset selection. We're always competitive with each other. And then um, yellow is our hybrid algorithm. And then green and red are um, green and red are other fast algorithms that are not optimal in terms of utility loss. Yeah. Do you happen to know if Apple switched to this algorithm at some point? Has Apple implemented this algorithm? I don't know. And if I knew, I probably couldn't say. But I don't know. <laughs> Um, okay. In terms of runtime, um, the previous state of the art for reasonable settings of universe sizes and data sizes or whatever, um, on my desktop took about half an hour to reconstruct the approximate histogram. Okay. I measured runtime in seconds, so that number of seconds is roughly a little more than half an hour. Projective geometry on the same data uh, took 37 seconds roughly. Our hybrid algorithm took about six seconds. And then recursive, had, ran, uh, recursive ha uh, Hadamard response and Hadamard response, these are algorithms that are really fast but have a constant factor. These are like the red and the green on the, on the plots. So they have a constant factor worse utility loss, but they are noticeably faster. So you know, we're not as fast as the fastest algorithms. And randomized response is like blazingly fast, but it has ridiculously bad errors, so you wouldn't use it. So um, you know, we're not as fast as the fastest, but we're, I think, like, of the same, we're like, you know, maybe it's acceptable. Um, and we're much faster than the previous state-of-the-art algorithm that had optimal utility loss. There was a question over there. Uh, how do you uh, generate the data in the experiment? How do, I, how do we generate the data? Like, what are the so, so we tried different things, and, the plot, and then the, we realized, like, trying different things, the plots didn't really change that much in terms of the shape. So, like, we tried spike data where there was, like, you know, one, like everyone has the same element one, right? We tried like zip fee and decay data with different like zip parameters. Um, what else did we try? So like you can see at the top left, so like this says zip, zip with some parameter. These are all zip, spike data. And I think there was one other thing we tried too, but it, the, the pictures always kind of looked similar. Yeah. Um, good. Yeah. Uh, I may have missed this. Is, is client runtime the same for all of these algorithms, or is that not really? Uh, client runtime. It's um, a good question. So it's not the same for all of them. For example, for subset selection, it's, it's really slow. Um, randomized response is really fast. Our algorithm, so what do you need to do? You need to, I think our algorithm has roughly log k. Like, so basically, you have your vector, which is an fq to the t. Well, you have an element, which is a number between 1 and k. You need to, you need to figure out like, what element of what projective point does this map to. That you can do in roughly t time. t is, remember, it's fq to the t. So t is roughly log base q of k. So it's not too big. And then you need to decide, OK, am I going to generate a vector orthogonal to this, a random vector orthogonal to this, or a random vector that's not orthogonal to this? So what, so what I'll do is I'll basically say, OK, if it's, or, if it's not orthogonal, then its dot product will be like a random number which is not 0 between, zero, between 1 and q minus 1. And then I need to generate a random vector that satisfies that dot product. So I, overall, the runtime is like t, which is like log base q of k for our algorithm. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the client side. OK, so yeah, so maybe in the last uh, part of the talk, Making our scheme fast. Why, is the, you know, why do we have a fast algorithm? So the idea, the overall, uh, the overall summary, I'll show you the details, is you find a recurrence relation to compute the thing you want to compute, and then you use dynamic programming. Okay. So actually, this, is my, this was my first time uh, writing DP, not, not differential privacy, dynamic programming. This was my first time writing dynamic programming code, not in a programming contest, I guess. Okay. Uh, so, so OK, so now let's think about what it is we want. So remember, f tilde of x is the sum over all i from 1 to n of alpha times an indicator of is mi preferred for x plus beta. I can, let me pull out the alpha out. And let me realize that I add beta all the time, so I just, just add a beta n at the end. OK. And now that inner sum, <clears throat> I want to count how many devices sent a preferred message. Okay. I'm going to think of that in a different way. 
I'm going to imagine that there's a histogram over message space. I'm going to call that Y. Y, y sub U is how many devices sent U as their message. OK. And now, so now I want to know how many preferred messages were sent for X. Let me sum up over all U that are canonical, meaning they're projective points, such that X dot U is 0 mod Q of Y sub U. OK. So I want, so at the end of the day, what I want is I want this sum for all x simultaneously. And once I have that sum for all x simultaneously, I can, I can now write down the histogram. Naively computing that sum would take about q, k over q time per x, because that's how many orthogonal u there are per x. And there are k values of x, so the naive runtime would be something like k squared over q. So quadratic time in the universe size. I'm trying to get something like linear time. OK. And we're going to do it using dynamic programming. And how does that work? So, you know, I'm actually I'm teaching undergrad algorithms this semester. I always tell students in, you know, when they are designing dynamic programming solutions, it's really just like brute force, rec brute force, you know, brute force uh, recursion, and then you add the memoization at the end. I mean, that's how I usually design these algorithms. And then later, if you want to implement it bottom up, you can. So what's this recursion? So I'm going to define f of abz as the sum of all y sub u's, where the length j prefix of u is a, the length t minus j suffix of u dotted with b is z, mod q. So I'm summing up over all u's that satisfy this of y sub u. That's the definition of f a b z. Okay. Now, what's the quantity I actually want to compute? I want to compute that, right? I want to compute this sum for some x. So the thing I actually want to compute is, I'm sorry, I should have written x here. Pretend this v is an x. The thing I actually want to compute is, well, z should be 0, because I want the dot product to be 0 mod q. Um, B should be x should be x itself, and then I want the length t suffix of u dotted with x to be zero. The length t suffix of u is all of u, so that means the prefix of u is a. The, that's the length zero prefix. So the length zero prefix is the empty string. So this is this is the thing that I want. Okay, and now what we'll show is that. FABZ satisfies a recurrence relation. Okay, what's the recurrence relation? Um, okay, I can maybe I'll. I don't want to get buried in the details, but let's walk through this a little bit. <coughs> so, okay, let's think about where we are. First of all, we have the base cases. Let us ignore the base cases. Let's get the recursive step. I guess that's the interesting part. I want that the length j, the length j prefix of u is a. And the length t minus j suffix of u is b. And the dot product is z. So basically, what I'm going to recurse on is if, if I know that the length j suffix of u is a, I'm going to recurse on all ways to ex prefix, sorry, all ways to extend that prefix by one, more, by one more element. So let me loop over all w's I can use to extend the prefix. OK. And then now, the new prefix is a concatenated with w. The new suffix is the old suffix, but where I removed the first element in it. And then now, what is the, remember, I, I want the dot product to equal z. So the new dot product, after I do that extension, it should be z minus b1 w mod q. Okay, so that when I add in, when I add in the b1 w, because remember, the, the character I lost was b1, b1 got multiplied by that w. So when I put that back in, I get z mod q. OK. <clears throat> and then there are two cases in the recursive step based on whether a is 0 or a is not 0. OK. Um, and why was that again? Um, ah, yes. So the point there is, remember, at the end of the day, a, a is a prefix of u. 
So as I extend A, I'm basically building out what U is, right? At the end of the recursion, when the recursion bottoms out at the base case, U needs to be a projective point, right? Which means its first non-zero entry, its first non-zero entry has to be A1. So if the A I've built out so far is all zeros, then the next thing I concatenate has to either be a zero or a one. But if it's not all zeros, if, that means I've already taken care of the starting one, then I'm allowed to append any number I want. It doesn't have to be a one anymore. Okay. And then, you know, if you just basically figure out what this means, you get a dynamic program that has kq squared t time and kq space. Right? You just count like how many A, B, Z possibilities are there and sum up the times over all of them. There's an optimization you can do, which is in this recursion, remember now, B is a suffix of U. U is canonical, meaning it's projective, meaning its first non-zero entry is a one. A suffix of a canonical vector is not necessarily canonical. Right? A suffix of a canonical vector might start with a number which is not a one. But, so which means B is not necessarily canonical. But the optimization is to observe that we only need to fill in entries of the DP table when B is also canonical. Why is that? Because if B is not canonical, just, I'm not gonna go through this too, I'm gonna spend too much time on this, but by definition of F, F of ABZ is the same as F of A, alpha B, alpha Z for any alpha. So just choose alpha to normalize B and make B canonical. So you only need to compute the, the, ta the entries of the DP table when B is also canonical, which essentially cuts down your number of states by a factor of Q, or Q minus one or something. So that, that saves you a factor of Q in your time, as well as a factor of Q in your space, and overall you get KQT time and K space. Um, and then if you, you know, there's the usual trick with bottom-up DP where you know, if you have like a, I guess here you have like a 3D table as your DP table, but you realize that like one dimension of the table, one like, you know, plane of the table only depends on the previous plane. So if you do bottom up, you can save memory by using, reusing memory. So you can do all that and implement it. Okay, and there it is, this is the full algorithm that's on GitHub. And you can see, I mean, that's exactly what's happening here. I don't know if you see like, there's some, there's some loops, swap last next, that's like swap you know, that's basically only keeping track of the last two slices of the DP table at a time to save memory. That's all that is. Okay, so um, trade-off. As I mentioned, we have a trade-off uh, possible between utility and um, runtime. And how does that trade-off work? The idea is you have this universe of size Q. You use a parameter H. You, you pretend that your uh, universe is, is like, you break it up into H blocks each of equal size k over h. So there's like the elements one, two, three, up to k over h, then k over h plus one, k over h plus two, up to two, q, two k over h, et cetera. These are the different blocks. You, you use randomized response to reveal which block your element is actually in. And then you do projective geometry response inside the block. And then that's your overall message as you send these two things together. And then you can show that um, this gives you the trade-off you want as a function of h. What next? And also the point is, remember, like the runtime is slow as a function of the universe size for projective geometry response. So as you make h larger and larger, k over h becomes smaller and smaller, which means you're doing PGR over a smaller universe, which is why you ended up getting faster. Um, one thing that I kind of swept under the, swept under the rug is, <laughs> For the algorithm to work, k has to be a power of, I mean, ideally, like, remember, we have to round t up. So we said, pick the smallest t you can, such that q to the t is at least k, or q to the t minus 1 over q minus 1 is at least k. So t is something like, you know, roughly the ceiling of log base q of k. But that ceiling, you know, might round up to the next integer, which means, effectively, you're working over a projective space that's a factor q larger, potentially, than you really wanted which means that your runtime is a factor Q slower than you ideally wanted, and your communication has an extra log Q bits that you maybe don't want. So can you get some kind of set system design that doesn't only work for such a sparse uh, set of values? 
you know, can I get a, can I get it so that there's always a set system that has message space being within a factor of two, let's say, of what I really wanted. And the other thing is like sub, you know, sublinear time. So um, this is related to something called the heavy hitters problem, which I'm not going to define. But the point is, we could hope to have an algorithm that solves problems like this in sublinear time. Not just linear, but sublinear. And in fact, we do. But those algorithms don't have the optimal utility loss. Remember this 4 times n times whatever? They don't get that. So can we get a sublinear time algorithm that actually has optimal utility loss? So that would be interesting. OK. So that's it for research part of the talk. And then we can talk about math stuff, math education stuff. So questions for this part? Yeah. Uh, so just a quick question about the, the normalization process for projective space. Yeah. Like R2, when you're constructing it, you just divide by the norm. Is like the fact that you can just set the first non-zero value to 1 just like a product of it being like in the prime? OK, so we're not working over R2. We're working over a finite field. Right, so yeah. is the fact that you can just set it to 1 to normalize it equivalent like some artifact of it being in a finite field? No, actually, I mean, even if we were working over reals, I would just normalize it to be 1. I wouldn't normalize it by the norm. Like dividing by the norm to get onto like the unit circle, right? Yeah, uh, oh, I see what you mean. Um, that's one way to do it. I mean, I could also normalize it so that the first entry is a 1, and that would put it on the L infinity ball. OK. Right? All right. OK. Instead of the L2 ball, I could do the L infinity ball. That would make it the first entry. Well, yeah. OK, so it's a like an L infinity norm is what you're like sure. passing by or something? Okay. Yeah. Well, but it's not even, it's not, I'm not dividing by the L infinity norm. I'm, I'm actually, I'm not, what I'm saying is crap. No, no, that's not, that's not true. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just normalizing so the first non-zero entry is a 1. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. Forget about norms. OK. Yeah, forget about norms. Yeah. So what is the state of the art in privacy preserving heavy hitters? Yeah, I mean, there are, I think the state of the art is probably, I, I had some paper in pods 2018 with uh, Uri Stemmer and Mark Bunn. And we didn't care, we, in that paper, we didn't care about constants at all. It was just like getting the right asymptotics for things. So I mean, I, I think for sublinear time algorithms, for heavy hitters, private heavy hitters, I, I don't think that there's been really any, any kind of progress in getting the right constants. I mean, do we have approximate? Uh, Sorry? Do we have approximate heavy hitters? Yeah, yeah, we do have, we do have sublinear time uh, heavy hitters algorithms. We do. In yes, in LDP. Yeah. Like for example, the, the paper I just mentioned, this uh, Bun, me, Mark Bun, Ari Stemmer, Pods 2018, for example. But it doesn't get the right utility loss. I mean, in terms of constant factors and things like that. And it's also, I think, there, it's not. It's, we're not measuring mean squared error. It's another. It's an error is measured, you know, via L infinity or something. Any other questions? Yeah. 